Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Marty Kessler coming to you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Uh, actually, no, that's where we are planning to be this morning. While you're watching this video, we're recording this on Wednesday prior to Sunday, but this is all in preparation for right now as you're watching this video. I hope you've been enjoying our studies on alleged contradictions and some of the solutions that Kim and I have worked out. I really appreciate him taking the class for the last two Sundays. I tried to talk him into doing it this Sunday while I was gone, but he was going to be gone as well. So here I am coming to you via the great technology we have today. My thanks to Hal and his setting this up for me and taking care of that. And uh, my thanks to whoever is plugging it in this morning to play it for you. So let's get right back to our, our class and our studies on alleged contradictions. I want to encourage you. I, I've not yet received any. I don't know that Kim has received any. But I want to encourage you to write down any contradictions that you have encountered or anyone that you've uh, heard from anyone else about. If you've got anything that you think is, is a possible contradiction, please write that down. What you think is the nature of that contradiction, put it on a piece of paper, a note card, whatever. Get it to myself, get it to Kim, and we promise you we'll do our best to get you an answer for that contradiction. Also, I want to encourage you to look for situations in life, different circumstances, and those of you who were here last week uh, will likely remember the four situations that I had encountered myself just in the week prior to our previous class, if that makes sense at all. But those are things that I just saw uh, going from one day to the next. And I'll, I'll run through those again in just a moment, Lord willing, for the benefit of those who weren't in class last week. But look for situations in class that could possibly be reported and then by those reports be seeming contradictions. And probably the best way to illustrate that is just to tell you about the four that I encountered. Uh, a couple Sundays ago, I talked to Chuck Eckert. He had on a nice long sleeve shirt, and on the cuff of that long sleeve shirt was some blood. I, I noticed, and I asked him about that, and I said, how come you've got blood on your cuff there? And he said, well, I hurt myself. Oh, when did you hurt yourself? I said, well, I hurt myself yesterday when I was working on the lawnmower. And I asked him, well, how come you've got blood on your shirt now? He said, well, I just bumped the wound that I got yesterday and got blood on my shirt today. So I could have uh, maybe talked to Laura about her doing the laundry and she might have said, well, I washed Chuck's shirt from the day that he worked on the lawnmower and there wasn't any blood on it. As a matter of fact, it was a short sleeve shirt. And yet Chuck had blood on his shirt from working on the lawnmower on the, the, the day after. And you can see how, based on how you would view that situation, how it could be a contradiction. Another one was, uh, I saw Jennifer Weaver walking into the church building one night just before Vacation Bible School, and she had in her left arm, I believe, is the one she was uh, using to carry jewelry, and in her right hand, she had a Little Caesars pizza. So, someone could have seen her and reported, oh, I saw Jennifer coming into the church building carrying jewelry. Someone else could have said, well, I saw Jennifer coming into the building carrying a pizza. And there would be a seeming contradiction. One writer says it's her baby. Another writer says it's her lunch or her dinner. And people could say, well, here's a contradiction when there's, in fact, no contradiction at all. She was carrying both jewelry and a pizza. Also, the, uh, where's, my, where's my other one here? Oh, yes, I called my sister. And if you were to ask me what time I called my sister, I would say, well, I called her at 7 o'clock. But if you could talk to my sister and ask her what time I called her, she would say it was 8 o'clock, a seeming contradiction, which is obviously explained by the differences in time zones. My sister lives in Georgia. But I would say 7 o'clock, she would say 8 o'clock. Would both of us be contradicting each other? No, of course, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same call at two different times based on where we were when the call was made and, and when it was received. The fourth one, where is that one? Oh yes, uh, most of two weeks ago on a Monday, most of that day I wore jeans and a, and a Hawaiian shirt, but then when I got home that evening, I put on a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. So somebody could have said, well, I saw Marty on that Monday and he was wearing jeans and a Hawaiian shirt. And somebody else could say, well, I saw him on that Monday too and he was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Now, if we were to read that in a historical document, they might say, aha, a contradiction. But I doubt I'm ever going to make a historical document. So at any rate, when you read that, you'd know, well, it's, it's a very good possibility that I was wearing two different sets of clothes on the same day. How many of us don't do that? 
How many of us don't wear something to work and then change into something later? And somebody could report, well, on that day you were wearing this. And somebody could say, but I saw them and they were wearing this. And it's not a contradiction at all. It's just two different times that we're talking about. So there are four examples of seeming contradictions as they could be reported that are not contradictions at all. And I want to encourage you to look for those as you go from one day to the next based on the idea that when we look at Scripture, we know that that's how some of these contradictions can be applied and turn out not to be any contradictions at all. Another thing I want to remind you about is the fact that these alleged contradictions are not coming from Kim and myself. We are taking the ones we're dealing with from a website that is called the Skeptics Annotated Bible. These are people who are reading the Bible and looking for contradictions that they believe are contradictions and noting those and then questioning those. And that's, this is where we're getting our alleged contradictions. We're getting it from the source of those who are, as I would say, enemies of Scripture and trying to point out things that they think are flaws. But you can go to that website yourself. You can see the same list. Just go to Skeptics Annotated Bible. And over on the, the right-hand side of the page, you'll see a list of areas where they uh, try to deal with contradictions. And there's one that's very specific, says contradictions. Click on that and you'll see the same list that Kim and I are using. Also, remember that in our, uh, our studies of alleged contradictions, that we cannot conclude that two statements are contradictory as long as there is a way to reconcile them. If there is a reasonable way to reconcile two statements that seem contradictory, then there's no demand that we conclude they are contradictory. We need to keep that in mind. Innocent until proven guilty is the standard of our justice system and for a very good reason. All right, another one of the contradictions. Let's get back into those that is dealt with on the Skeptics Annotated Bible website is that the names of the apostles as they are listed in the New Testament are different. And so there's disagreement, there's contradiction between the lists of names of the apostles. The first list of the apostles' names is found in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 to 4. So I want to encourage you to go there, turn over to Matthew 10, 2 to 4. And this is one of the things that I do when I study. When I know that I'm finding a list, for example, in Matthew 10, 2 to 4 of the apostles' names, I'll find other places where those, that list also exists, and I'll make a note there. I'll say at Matthew 10, 2-4, I'll write down in the margin or somewhere in the text, go to Mark 3, 16-19, which is the next Gospel writer's list of the Apostles. And when you go to Mark 3, 16-19, then make a note there, go to Luke 6, 14-16. That way when you see that reference in in Mark 3, 16 to 19, you'll know the next one is in Luke 6, 14 to 16. You can also, if you like, make another note that says go back and check Matthew 10, 2 to 4. So you get all these lists connected. The fourth and final list of the apostles' names is found in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. So if you go to Luke 6, 14 to 16, and make a note there, see Acts 1, 1, to, uh, 1 verse 13, then you'll have all four lists of the apostles' names annotated, dictated, uh, written down in your scriptures so you'll, you'll have a little bit easier way to study like that. Now when you look at all four lists, the only name that really seems to be different is the one we find in Matthew's Gospel where he is called, the apostle is called Labaius. And then in our English translations it has surname Thaddeus. And then you go to Mark's list of the apostles and you have just the name Thaddeus. There is no Labaius. It simply calls the apostle Thaddeus in Mark's version. Then when you go to Luke chapter 6, you'll see instead of Labaius or Thaddeus, you see that there is a name there listed who is Judas, brother of James. And then when you go to the list of apostles in Acts chapter 1, that name is also the one you see there, Judas, brother of James. So Matthew talks about Labaius, surnamed Thaddeus, Mark talks about Thaddeus. Luke and Acts do not talk about Labaius. They do not talk about Thaddeus. They talk about a fellow by the name of Judas, who is the brother of James. Both Luke and Acts, of course, it makes sense to think of it in terms of Luke being the author of Luke and Acts. Luke records that apostle being Judas, brother of James, whereas Matthew and Mark record the name of Labaius, surname Thaddeus. Now, is this 
necessarily a contradiction. Well, is it possible that Labaius, whose surname is Thaddeus, is also known as Judas, the brother of James? Is that a legitimate, reasonable possibility? If that's a legitimate, reasonable possibility, then there's no need to come down on this as a definite contradiction. Um, anybody know Frank Walters? What does Wilma call Frank? Wilma calls Frank Jr. And that confused me at first because I we were talking to her and she said something about Jr. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe she's talking about her son. This was years and years ago when I, when I first met Wilma and realized, oh, no, she's not talking about her son. She's talking about the person I know as Frank. And I will always remember the first time I went to a hospital uh, looking to visit Dave Roberts. I asked for Dave Roberts. I said, is Dave Roberts on your list of patients? And they said, no, he's not. That's when I found out that Dave's name is Carol. Of course, everybody knows him as Dave. So you're looking for Dave, you're looking for Carol. It's the same guy, just two different names. Uh, any country western music fans in here? Merle Haggard, years ago, wrote a song about a guy he called Leonard in the song. And he even mentioned in the course of the song that Leonard was not the name that the guy used. He had a stage name. He didn't give the stage name in the song. But if you do a little research, you'll find out that the Leonard that Merle Haggard was talking about went by the stage name Tommy Collins. So if you're talking about the Leonard of Merle Haggard's song's fame, you're talking about Tommy Collins. Two very different names, very different titles, but but the same guy. And none of this should be all that strange to us really because when we look in the New Testament, we see the Apostle Peter. But what was Peter also called? Peter was also called Simon. Sometimes he's even referred to as Simon Peter. But what else was Simon Peter called? Jesus called him Cephas. So he had three names, did he not? Simon, Peter, and Cephas. And then, of course, there was another apostle. His name was Saul. But we don't think of him as Saul because that was his name prior to becoming an apostle. When he became an apostle, his name changed to Paul. So we should not be surprised that we see people who are the same individual, just named in different ways. Of course, easily enough, just from Matthew and Mark, we see his name is Labaius and Matthew includes the information, his surname was Thaddeus, whereas Mark simply calls him Thaddeus. If, if Matthew did not give us that information, surname Thaddeus, we might think, oh, Labaius and Thaddeus, oh, that has to be two different guys. Well, it's not. It's the same guy. And that's actually the same guy, almost certainly, as Judas, the brother of James. All right. Uh, any questions? Good. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there at some point during this recording. All right, let's go to another alleged contradiction. Let's go back to the Old Testament, to Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And look, let's look at the, uh, the allegation. Talk about alleged contradictions. An alleged contradiction is based on an allegation. I think that's right. An allegation that Abraham had more than one son. And of course, everybody knows Abraham had more than one son. However, the scriptures do say in some places, your only son, which is one of these places here in Genesis 22. Genesis chapter 22, this is where God calls on Abram, or Abraham to ascend Mount Moriah and offer his son, your only son, Isaac. This is in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Now, we see the obvious phrase, your only son, here in Genesis 22, 2. If we go to Hebrews chapter 11, we'll see uh, the same idea given here. Hebrews chapter 11, let's see, that's... Uh, what verse was that? Da, 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 da. Yes, verse 17. By faith, when Abraham, or by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. 
and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. So we see your only son in Genesis 22 and your only begotten son in Hebrews chapter 11. And the detractors demand that this is a contradiction because obviously Abraham had other sons. If we go back to Genesis 25, for example, we can read here that Abraham had sons by Keturah. And I don't know if I marked, yes, I did mark 25. Genesis chapter 25 says, Now Abraham took another wife. Sarah had passed away. Sarah was gone. So Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore to him Zimron and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. And these are sons of Abraham. So he obviously had other sons. We already know he had Ishmael. Ishmael was the first son. But what was the difference between all of those sons and Isaac? And of course we know in the context of Scripture, in the context of God working with Abraham, Isaac was the one son of promise. If you go to Genesis, oh, let's see, 15, this is where we read these words. Genesis chapter 15 says, Then behold, verse 4, The word of the Lord came to him, came to Abram, saying, This man will not be your heir. Talking about Eleazar, one of his servant's uh, sons. This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. In other words, God was telling Abram, I'm going to give you a son. This Eleazar is not the one. Later on, Abraham and Sarah, as the years go by, evidently begin to doubt that God is going to... Uh, come through on this promise. So they concocted this plan, actually Sarah concocted this plan, for Abram to have a son, have a child, by Hagar, Sarah's handmaid. So Abram sleeps with Hagar. She has a son. His son, that son is named Ishmael. About 14 years or so before Isaac is finally given, the son of the promise. But Ishmael was not the son God promised. Isaac was the only son, the only son of the promise. And that's the context in which we are reading these passages about Isaac being the only son. He's the only son God promised. He's the only son through whom God was going to bring His promise to fruition of blessing the entire world. The only son through whom God would bring forth His promise of making Abram's descendants like the stars of the sky or like the sand of the seashore. All of God's promises were in connection and based on that one son, that one son that was promised and that one son was Isaac. So even though we know, and the scriptures tell us clearly that Abraham had other sons. God knew that. God knew what he was inspiring Moses to write down about this history of Abram and his having Ishmael first and then after Isaac having other sons with Keturah. And the Jews knew that Abram had other sons, other children with other women. But what they focused on is what God focused on, is what the context is all about. And that is the one son with whom God was concerned, and that son was Isaac. So when we look at it in the context of Scripture, we can see that it's obvious there's no contradiction. All right, that deals with uh, Abram and how many sons he had. While we are here in Genesis, hopefully you're still in Genesis, let's look at another alleged contradiction dealing with how old Abram was when Ishmael was born. If you look at chapter 16 of Genesis, this is what we read here in verse 16. Genesis chapter 16, verse 16. It says, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. So, how old is Abram? When Ishmael is born, the text says he is 86. Now, if we look at Acts chapter 7, keep a finger in Genesis, keep a marker there because we'll come back to it. 
But if you look at Acts chapter 7, this is where Stephen is preaching. And he's recounting the history of the nation of Israel. And he, he starts with Abram and God's call to Abram. And this is what uh, Stephen preaches. And he's accurate in what he says. Acts chapter 7, verse 2. And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come, out into, the, or come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are now living. And there is where the issue of the years and the numbers and the timing uh, comes to bear. Because Stephen says that it's after Terah died, uh, Abraham's father, that Abraham came into the land uh, that they now know as Israel. So, how old was Terah when he died? That's a very significant uh, question for this uh, alleged contradiction. For that, we go back to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Verse 32, the last verse of Genesis chapter 11 says, The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Terah was 205 years old when he died in Haran, and Abram did not leave to come into the land of Canaan or the promised land, the land that would become Israel, until after Terah died at the age of 205 years. So if you do the math, Abram must have been 135 when he left uh, Haran to come into Israel based on, based on, based on this. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 26. Genesis 11, 26. I hope you're still with me on this. Genesis 11, 26. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now here's where the problem comes in. The detractors, those who claim there is a contradiction here, are claiming that since Genesis eleven twenty six says that Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, that Abram was born at that 70-year point in Terah's life. That is their claim. That's the basis for this alleged contradiction. But what I would say to you is that that's not what Genesis eleven twenty six says. What I believe Genesis eleven twenty six says is that Terah became a father when he was 70 years old. And after becoming a father with his firstborn son, then he had two successive sons after that. Otherwise, we are uh, compelled to believe that these boys were triplets. And I don't think they were triplets. There's nothing said to that effect. As a matter of fact, if you stay within the context of Genesis and go back to the end of chapter 5, we read at the end of chapter 5, well, let's see, let me get my text straight here. Uh, yes, Genesis 5, 32. It says, Noah was 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Did he have triplets as well? Or is the age of 500 when Noah finally became a father? Wouldn't it be great to be able to live 500 years before you have kids? You might know a little bit more about having kids if you could live 500 years first. But that was the way it happened back then. Things were different back then. And if you don't think things were different back then, look at the creatures we dig up in the world. Everything was larger. Everything was bigger. Beavers were the size of bears. There were huge, giant mastodons, buffalo. Everything was bigger. Every form of uh, quadruped we have now was bigger in the days before the flood. And as we uncover those things, buried by the waterborne sediment, that surely was a result of the flood, everything was larger probably because it lived longer as well, and other factors thrown in. But aside from that, what the text says is that Abraham lived to a certain age, and then he became the father of three boys. 
And I don't believe we're meant to understand that he became the father of three boys all at once at that age. Rather that he started becoming a father and he had three sons. And I believe that's the same thing that we're being taught in Genesis 11 verse 26 about Tira. He became 70 years old, started becoming a father, and after he became a father the first time he had two other sons later on in time. But he started to become a father when he was 70. So that's what the alleged contradiction is based on. But if we don't force the text to say that, if we don't force the text to say that Abram was born when Tira was 70, then there's no reason to believe that he was 135 or so when he finally left Haran to go into Canaan. It makes much more sense and makes the picture much more viable when we imagine that Tira first became a father with his firstborn and then later Abraham was born. And so there's no contradiction with the age that we are given in Genesis about him being 86 when Ishmael was born. I hope I've made that clear enough, but at least you have these passages of Scripture that you can reference and some of the reasoning that I'm using to uh, restudy this some on your own. Now, let's make sure I've look at my notes here, make sure I've covered everything that I wanted to cover on those before I move on. All right, I think I have. Go to our next alleged contradiction which is, how long was the ark at the house of Amenadab? 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2. From the day that the ark remained at Kiriath-Jerim, the time was long, for it was twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So in this context, in this one verse, and that verse's context, how long does it say the ark was at Kiriath-Jerim, at the house of Amenadab? 20 years. And for this 20 years, what was Israel doing, according to verse 2? For this 20 years, Israel was lamenting. Now here's where the detractors come in. They look at that 20 years, and they say it was there for 20 years. Then they also go to Stephen's sermon. They're, they're basing a lot on the validity of Stephen's sermon, aren't they? Isn't this, uh, this is very interesting to me. So if you go back to Acts chapter 7, keep a, keep a finger there in 1 Samuel because we'll come back to that. But in Acts chapter 7, where we are looking at, I'm sorry, 13. I'm getting my, my Acts sermons mixed up here. It's not Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7 this time. It's Paul's in Acts chapter 13. So in chapter 13, verse 21, Paul says, Then they asked for a king. God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. 40 years. Now here's the deal. The detractors note that the ark was in Kiriath-Jerim for 20 years. And the ark was placed there prior to Saul becoming king. So Saul becomes king after the ark is placed in Kiriath-Jerim. And Saul is king for how long? According to Acts chapter 13 and Paul's lesson there, 40 years. So it would seem like well, the, the ark would have to be in Kiriath-Jerim for more than 40 years if the ark is brought out after Saul is dead, which is what we seem to read in... 2 Samuel chapter 6. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, let's see, make sure I'm leading you in the right place here. Yes, chapters, chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. It says, David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal le Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, or Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they're bringing the, the ark out of the house of Abinadab. And this is obviously after David has become king and Saul has met his demise, because that's what happens at the end of 1 Samuel. And uh, David deals with the young man who claims to have slain Saul 
in the first chapter of 2 Samuel. And now we're getting to this point. So we know it's the, the ark is being removed from the house of Abinadab after Saul has ceased his kingship and after David has become king for some time. Now, here's what we need to do. We need to go back to the original text, back to 1 Samuel chapter 7 and read everything about what is stated there about the length of time the ark was in the house of Abinadab in its context. And the first thing we need to do is get the context, the historical picture of why the ark was there in the first place. If you go back to chapter 5, I'm sorry, chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. The Philistines and Israel met in battle according to verse 1. And Israel was defeated according to verse 2. And so they were trying to figure out what can we do to keep from being defeated the next time. So they came to the elders of Israel in verse 3 and they say, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us take to ourselves from Shiloh, because at that time the ark was in Shiloh. Let us take from ourselves the ark of the covenant from Shiloh, that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. Now, was that God's plan or was that the plan of weak-minded, carnal-minded, fleshly-minded men? course that was a plan of fleshly minded men. This was not God's plan. God did not come down and say, hey, if you want to win, go get the ark, take it out of Shiloh, take it with you into battle, and everything will be fine. So this was their plan. They took the ark into battle. They lost. The Philistines took possession of the ark of the covenant. Isn't that interesting? This is the ark that God gave Israel, the ark of the covenant that He had with them. And they uh, abuse its place among them so much that now the Philistines have taken custody of it. When we read through chapter 5, we found all the horrible things that God did to the Philistines while they had possession of the ark. And it was so bad for them that they said, we got to get rid of this thing. And so they sent the ark back to Israel. So Israel has suffered these major military defeats. They've lost the ark to the Philistines. They get the ark back after the Philistines send it back to them. And that takes place in chapter 6 where the Philistines return it because God has smitten them so horribly because they've, they've taken possession of this ark and they're not supposed to have it. So when they send it back, that's when they put it into the house of Amenadab at kiriath Jearim. That's how the ark came to be there in the first place. So with that context in mind, that historical setting, then we read this in chapter 7, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. And the men of kiriath Jearim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Amenadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark remained at kiriath Jearim, the time was long, for it was twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So the ark's been there for twenty years. And for that twenty years they lamented. They knew how they lost it. They knew how they got it back and they didn't do it. The Philistines brought it back. It's like they said, well, now we're ashamed to do anything with it. They put it in the ark of the Lord, and it stays there for 20 years. Verse 3, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve Him alone, and He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. And so the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and served the Lord alone. You see what's happening? The ark comes back after this great defeat and low spiritual tide line of, of Israel's um, relationship with God. It stays in the house of Abinadab for 20 years. And then Samuel says, in a sense, enough is enough. Let's, let's do the right thing. And so they returned to God, having repented of their sins. And it says in verse 5, Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. They gathered to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mizpah. To me, it's obvious that in this context, what the writer is saying when he says the ark was at the house of Amenadab for 20 years, it's that 20 year period of lament. The 20 year period of we're not going to have anything to do with it because the last time we pulled it out we did a horrible thing in doing so. We lost it to the Philistines and now it's in the house of Amenadab. We've got Eleazar taking care of it and we're so ashamed that we're not going to handle it. 
But after 20 years, Samuel says, it's long enough. He rallies Israel. They repent. What were they repenting of? Well, they were obviously repenting of their behavior and their dealings with the idols and the Ashtaroth for that 20 year period and even before that. And now they're getting things on track again spiritually and they are taking back what they should have had in the first place and that is their spiritual relationship with God. Now, that little dig, 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 dig there means that I've been talking for 35 minutes. I can't believe I've been talking for 35 minutes. But uh, that's what it says. So it's probably about time for me to wrap this up. Let me see if I want to cover anything else before I wrap this up. I guess I have covered most everything. There's one more. One more. Should I do it to you or should I let you go? Let's see, I'm thinking by the time you get in class and you get started, it's probably, yeah, it's probably been about 40 minutes at least already. Uh, I, I won't go into the next one. Uh, am I hearing any amens? All right, whatever. You say amen if you want to. I'm not here. I can't hear you. I'm in Colorado having a good time. I'm either worshiping with the church, Lord willing, there in Bear Valley, or I'm up in Breckenridge somewhere. So uh, at any rate, I hope you guys are having a great time here. I hope you enjoyed this class. I really hope you're getting something out of this. And please, if you've encountered any contradictions, you run into any, you've read about any, write them down. Give them to myself when I get back. Or you can come to Colorado and give them to me. That'd be okay too. Or you can give them to Kim. Either way you want to do it, uh, that'd be fine. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I look forward to seeing you when I get back. Lord, love you.